posting on YouTube. Testing on YouTube, testing on YouTube. Testing on YouTube. All right, it's working on YouTube. Awesome, now we just gotta wait for X. X should be live here in a second. <clears throat> see all right it should be live now live on x let's test testing on x all right we're live on x perfect let's get this started Alrighty. Lucas Smith, Duster, my beloved. Are you one of the Duster authors? Let's see. No, you are not. Are you one of these authors? No, okay. How's it going, James McLean? All right, let me take a sip of this yerba mate here. Yerba mate is the best way to caffeinate yourself. And uh, let's blow the horn here and get it started. All right. Welcome, everybody, to a nice, cozy Sunday stream here. We're going to be Looking into the world of 3D Gaussian splatting and computer vision, specifically this stream is called Instant Splat and Duster. It's got a three in the name there to let you know that they're uh, elite hacksaws. Sam M, the authors were quite pissed about not getting the oral. So Sam M there is referring to some shenanigans with the conference that Either Duster, I think this paper also had some drama associated. Basically, not always the best papers get highlighted at these conferences. There's different tiers of like, there's like best paper, and then there's, do you get uh, in the highlights? Then there's like, or, or do you actually get an oral presentation? Do you just get a poster? So these different journals that you publish these papers to, they eventually get a conference. And then there's, again, these different kind of hierarchies of like, how how much promotion do you get? And it's supposed to be meritocratic where the best papers get the most promotion and get the most uh, kind of highlight, but it's kind of not usually the case. Usually there's some shenaniganry happening where people who are in the kind of inner circle of the organizers of the conference, the friends of those people have a little bit more say. They get their papers shown. So I don't know. I don't think it's necessarily worth getting into the drama though. You know, just worry about the technical stuff and everything else just melts away. So for today's stream, we're going to be looking at two papers, really a couple more papers because these papers reference other papers. But the, the main paper we're going to be looking at is this paper called Instant Splat, which was released on the 29th of March from University of Texas, Austin, NVIDIA Research. Shiamen University, Stanford University, a whole kind of squad of universities here. And this paper is a 3D Gaussian splatting paper. And kind of the big uh, difference with this paper compared to other 3D Gaussian splatting papers is that this one's going to be using Duster for the initialization of the Gaussian splats. A lot of the other Gaussian splatting papers use what's called Colmap which is a little bit dated at this point. And that's why we're gonna be looking at Duster as well. So most of the time will be spent on Duster and Instant Splat. How's it going, Tokyo Spliff? So let's get started with the abstract here of Instant Splat. Uh, novel view synthesis, which is the creation of an image 
or a view. A view is a specific two-dimensional image from a 3D scene. So a novel view synthesis is generating an image of a view, aka a specific angle from a scene that you haven't seen before. Okay, so maybe you have a couple pics of this statue from this angle and you kind of want to pick from the other angle. That would be novel view synthesis. Uh, it typically requires an initial estimation of camera intrinsic and extrinsics from dense viewpoints. Camera intrinsics and extrinsics refers to intrinsics is information that is intrinsic to the camera. So it's a matrix of information that includes things like the focal point, the principal point, kind of the distortion of the lens. So different types of cameras, if you're using a camera that has a, like a fisheye kind of effect, that's going to have a different camera intrinsic. If you're using a camera that has a big lens, so it has like a kind of a weird uh, focal situation that's going to mess with that. And then camera extrinsic is more the position of the camera relative to the three-dimensional scene. So think of extrinsics as the things external to the camera, aka the position of the camera in a scene, and then the intrinsic as the properties of the camera itself. And usually those are kind of hard to get, right? That's one of the big sticking points in a lot of these uh, computer vision pipelines is that they're a huge pain to get. Camera intrinsics, you need to know the information of the camera, the manufacturer that created your camera, the, sp the specific settings when you're taking a picture of the camera, any lenses that you're doing. It's a bit of a complicated mess. And extrinsics are even more annoying because now <clears throat> you need to know the exact position in the, of the camera, the six-dimensional rotation and pose of that camera relative to all the other pictures you took of that scene. And that stuff is basically impossible to know from a ground truth level, unless you're inside one of these kind of like tracking domes and you're, uh, you know exactly where the camera is. But like, if you're just taking pictures of a, of a statue like this, you really don't have a good idea of what the extrinsics are. You're gonna have to kind of guess. And that introduces a lot of errors in what's called these structure from motion pipeline, where the structure from motion refers to that you're getting the structure, aka kind of the extrinsics, aka the the scene itself, the structure of the scene from the motion of the camera. So as the camera's moving around, you're kind of doing some triangulation of it and kind of guessing at what these ex in extrinsic camera parameters are going to be. In this paper, they're going to integrate the strengths of point-based representations, aka 3D Gaussian splatting. 3D Gaussian splatting is the new uh, 3D representation that everybody is in love with, kind of in a in a war right now with nerfs, although there are ways to combine them together. But 3D Gaussian splatting is basically just a set of little 3D Gaussian splats, aka these little kind of bubbles, you can think of them like little ellipses that are just scattered all over your scene and you're creating your scene out of these little bubbles. <laughs> I know that's kind of a simple explanation, but we're gonna get deep into the math as well, so stick around if you want some of that. If this live stream has caption, it would be better for me. WJ Joe. I don't know how to do like live captioning, but thanks for the suggestion. How's it going, Khalil? Can we generate nerfs for our mesh on the fly, or is it something that we can prepare beforehand? It's a question from Tokyo. Uh, if you have a mesh of an object, a, a mesh and a texture, which is a very explicit type of 3D representation, you can create a nerf for that. All you got to do is just load that textured mesh into some kind of program like Blender and then take a bunch of pictures of it from a bunch of different angles. And you, because it's a simulation, right, it's Blender, you're gonna know the exact camera intrinsic and extrinsics associated with those pictures. And then you can quite easily uh, use that to create a nerf. But the nerf itself is just gonna be like a little multi-layer perceptron that you've trained on these uh, camera images that you've taken in something like Blender. Uh, and it's going to be different from your mesh. So once you have your nerf, you can render from that, or you can just use your mesh and texture. How's it going, Emily? More questions from Tokyo. I mean, can we do that real time for procedurally generated meth with mesh with a game engine? I don't know about real time, but yeah, you can. It's certainly automated, right? You could certainly create a. I know Blender. You can script Blender with Python, so you could create a Python script that just loads a textured mesh from like a, a directory filled with textured meshes and then trains a little nerf and then you have that. You can train nerfs for every single one of your textured meshes. So 
you could definitely set up a script that would do that so you could reduce the amount of manual dragging things around in 3D that you want to do. Okay. <laughs> uh, going back to this abstract. Uh, instant Splat, right? The name Instant comes from the fact that it's going to be fast. It's not quite instant. Instant, there's no kind of mathematical definition for what instant means. Here they're saying that it's less than one minute, which is pretty quick when it comes to these uh, structure for motion, kind of creating an object from a series of multi-view images. So being able to do it in less than one minute on a consumer GPU, they don't quite mention it here, but later on in the paper, they do mention that they do this under a minute on an NVIDIA A100, which is maybe a, like a little bit beyond consumer GPU. I don't think a lot of people have A100s on their <laughs> in their computers, but A100s are pretty cheap on uh, cloud services, so you can definitely rent one out if you want to do it. Instant Splat is a two-part pipeline. There's going to be two pieces here. The first part is going to be coarse geometric initialization, unfortunately called CGI, which also stands for computer generated imagery, but here it stands for coarse geometric initialization. And then the second part of this is gonna be a fast 3D Gaussian optimization, which they call F3DGO. So kind of terrible with the acronyms here. So <laughs> CGI as an acronym, not a good idea in the computer vision world, I guess. And then F3DGO also feels like a terrible acronym, but all right, they're gonna be showing this on the famous Tanks and Temples dataset, and uh, you can view some of their results on this GitHub page here. So they have some nice little results here. They're comparing to Nope Nerf, which is a Nerf-based technique, and you can see how theirs is gonna take significantly shorter, so Theirs is done in uh, roughly about 37 seconds. You get the full view of this horse from some set of camera images of this horse, and the nope nerf takes about 90 minutes. So significantly faster, and uh, I don't know if the quality is 100% the same. It's kind of here they're kind of showing you that the quality is better, but they're doing that probably by comparing to some work that is not as good. But generally, it's very difficult to determine quality on these things anyways because they're using these quantitative metrics such as SSIM and FID that are difficult to judge. So as long as the quality isn't garbage, you know, that's really what we're concerned about. Uh, would be awesome to have an A100. I agree with you, Emily. I kinda, I'm just waiting for uh, the tiny box to come out so that I can get a tiny box and everybody can start benchmarking these things in terms of tiny boxes. It takes one second on a tiny box, right? Uh, okay, let's go deeper here. Novel view synthesis is about rendering unseen viewpoints based on a limited number of shots, AKA sparse view. So sparse view means you don't have a lot of these images. Sparse input data does not sufficiently cover the scene. That means that uh, if you only have a couple images, you, you're gonna have to learn to make up the details, right? So if you have only a couple images of this scene here, of this uh, kind of like guy holding a child, right? You don't, maybe you don't actually even have a picture that shows this guy's face. So at some point, in order to get the full 3D representation of this, you're gonna have to imagine what that guy's face looks like. So that's one of the problems with sparse input data, but it's always gonna be sparse, right? In the real world, it's gonna be very difficult to have uh, a completely dense uh, set of views that pretty much look at every single nook and cranny of some 3D object. Not only that, but a lot of these existing structure for motion pipelines like Colmap assume precise camera poses, so you need to know exactly where your camera was when it took the picture, and they presume dense data coverage, and they assume to know camera intrinsics. And if you're working in simulation, that's totally fine, right? Because you know the camera intrinsics if you're using a simulated camera and you know the camera poses if you're using a simulated camera. But when it comes to the real world, you don't know the camera poses and you don't know the camera intrinsics. So you have to rely on these pipelines that kind of take forever and are a little bit annoying to use. Instant Splat, a framework that unifies the explicit 3D Gaussian representation with pose priors obtained from an end to end dense stereo model duster. And we're, we're gonna go into the duster paper but actually, here's a 
mistake here. Dwesser. That's not how you say it. It's called Duster. Uh, concurrent optimization of 3D Gaussian attributes and camera parameters. So 3D Gaussian papers or any kind of 3D Gaussian approach, what you're optimizing is the actual properties of each of those little 3D Gaussians. So each of those little 3D Gaussians uh, has properties such as the center, right? So each little bubble has a little center, X, and R3, so X, Y, Z position. It has this covariance matrix, which you could think of it kind of defines the which which ends of the bubble are kind of ellipsoids and which which parts of the bubble are kind of thin, so it's kind of, the, really it looks more like little ellipses. You also have some spherical harmonic coefficients to give it that view-dependent effect, but ultimately, just think of a little Gaussian splat as a set, right? Maybe a million of these little Gaussians, and each of those little Gaussians has a little vector that represents all these different little properties, and in a Gaussian splat, what you're doing is you're pushing gradients directly into those properties and optimizing them over a series of steps. So that's actually kind of similar to what you're doing in a lot of these uh, structure for motion pipelines, except in those structure for motion pipelines, what you're trying to optimize over a series of iterations is the camera parameter. So you're basically using a bunch of constraints and a bunch of uh, bi inductive biases that you've decided based on geometry and, and triangles that allow you to update and slowly update over time your initial guesses for these camera poses and these camera intrinsics to get to some point that kind of makes sense. So in this paper, they said, hey, well, why don't we do those at the same time, right? If we're gonna be optimizing for these 3D Gaussian parameters and we're gonna be optimizing for these camera parameters, rather than kind of have a two-part pipeline where we do those separately, let's kind of try to optimize them at the same time. And maybe there can be a little bit of information that kind of leaks and helps one task with the other task. And this is gonna actually allow them to remove entire parts of the 3D Gaussian pipeline that are annoying, which they call the adaptive density control. So eschewing, which is just a fancy way of saying not having to do, okay, so by doing these two things together, we're not gonna have to do this adaptive density control. Okay, so we're gonna go to the actual paper, so not this one, this one. So this is the actual 3D Gaussian paper that introduced them. We actually also have a stream on this one if you're interested. But here, in this part of the paper in figure two, this is the full pipeline, and you can see that 3D Gaussian papers actually start with a set of points here. So these SFM points, those actually come from something like Colmap. So already, this pipeline looks kind of complicated, but it's even more complicated because these SFM points are the output of a Colmap pipeline, right? So we're gonna actually go back to that, but this is the Colmap pipeline. <laughs> so. In order to even uh, get to your final novel view image in a Gaussian splat pipeline, you first start with the image that you have, and you go through this coal map structure from motion pipeline, which includes extracting the features from the images, then matching each of those points or key points, doing some geometric verification. This itself is probably like kind of runs for a couple iterations. Then you do this incremental reconstruction, initialization, image registration, triangulation, outlier filtering, bundle adjustment. That's gonna run for a bunch of steps. And then what's gonna come out of that is gonna be these SFM points. Okay, now you have these SFM points. You use those to initialize your Gaussians. And then you have your camera information. Then you go through this loop right here, this optimization process right here. And you see this adaptive density control. That's the part that we're gonna be able to skip. So this paper here, the instant splat, really what it is, it's a combination of this and this, and they're just gonna mash those two together and they're gonna simplify it. And one of the things they can remove is this adaptive density control, which is basically a bunch of hard-coded rules to, to adaptively densify the Gaussian. So sometimes, you're gonna have too many Gaussians in one place, and sometimes you're gonna have not enough Gaussians in one place. Sometimes you're gonna have Gaussians that are kind of just sitting there and floating, which are called floaters, and you kind of wanna get rid of them. So pruning the Gaussians, aka removing Gaussians, and densifying Gaussians, or adding more Gaussians in places where you feel like you need a little bit more details, that's what is uh, falls under the umbrella of this adaptive density control. So being able to get rid of all of this, which is based on a bunch of hard-coded crap, like there's all these thresholds here, 
So thresholds, it's like if there's multiple Gaussians within like two millimeters and each Gaussian has an opacity of this, then therefore we're going to remove at least one of the Gaussians. So like, you don't want to have those type of hard-coded heuristics that have a bunch of hard-coded uh, uh, thresholds and magic numbers in there, like like this number here. Like what the fuck is that? 0 0.002, right? Like you want to get rid of all that crap. So if you can get rid of all of that and not have this adaptive density control, it's better, you know? Less stuff for your computer to do and less stuff for you to do, so it's going to be faster. Uh, all right, so this works under one minute in a NVIDIA A100. And that's pretty much the introduction section. We're going to go into the related works. I generally don't like these related works because uh, they're a little bit tedious, you know? You spend a lot of time kind of reading uh, oh, people started with nerfs, and then nerfs have this advantage, and then this advantage is actually uh, solved by this paper, which is then causes this thing. So, like, they kind of lead you down this wi this kind of, like, windy path that doesn't actually serve any purpose, right? I think that as humans, you have a limited amount of brain attention and brain context, and filling in uh, filling your brain context with kind of the historical legacy path is kind of never feels satisfying to me, right? I'd rather just kind of know what people are doing now and then just kind of assume that the history that took us there uh, took some dead ends that ended up nowhere and blah, blah, blah. All right. Damn, you guys are already popping off. Uh, can we convert the duster output to call map format or how exactly point maps are initialized to Gaussian splatting? Ye yeah, so uh, this is a question from Josh Na. Yeah, you will be able to, so the output of duster is gonna be a point map and you can use those point maps. You can put them in whatever format call map outputs, but the secret is you're not gonna have to do that at all, right? So ideally you won't have to, go from duster into this like SFM point and then use that SFM point to feed it into here, right? The whole point of this is that it does all of that together. So you won't have to convert into these intermediate representations. <laughs> so much drama with Tinybox and AMD, quote comment by Joseph. Yeah, it seems like they finally, George finally got his way though, because I think if I remember, I didn't quite look into it, but it seems like AMD agreed to open source their firmware. So that should be able to allow uh, GeoHots to get in there and uh, be able to give us a really nice tiny box product that doesn't just crash constantly. So I don't know, hopefully it works out because uh, it'd be awesome to have like kind of like a mini consumer server rack. You know, right now, if you want to do anything that is bigger than like a NVIDIA 4090 or like a 3090, which is what I have, you kind of have to go to the cloud, right? But if I could have something locally, that would be pretty awesome, you know? Because you never know when the next meteor is going to hit or the next solar storm is going to hit. So it'd be really awesome if I could use solar panels to power local compute to power my home robot rather than relying on cloud, you know? Because you don't know what they're going to do with that. Okay, so the main things to talk about here in the related works is kind of some of the problems that we've had to deal with that traditionally require over 100 images as input and utilize pre-processing software such as ColMap to compute the camera in intrinsics and intrinsics, right? So these structure from motion pipelines of which ColMap is the most popular require known ground truth camera poses or they require dense video sequences. So a video sequence basically means that you're filming. So you're, you're kind of like filming around your object in order to kind of get it, but then you're cutting that video into a sequence of frames. And that's why a, a video sequence is kind of like a dense sequence of images with known camera intrinsics. So even more shit that you don't know. Colmap, soft, Colmap software tends to be unreliable to produce camera poses and register all the input images. Uh, and this duster is markedly faster than Colmap. So duster is going to be simpler than Colmap, faster than Colmap, and pretty much better than Colmap in pretty much every way. So uh, we're going to start here. Why don't we just uh, go through this preliminary here where they introduce what Gaussian splatting is. And then once we're finished with the introduction of Gaussian splatting, we'll go into the duster paper. So in here, they, they actually do summarize basically the duster paper, but I figured better than talking than looking at their summary of the duster paper we can just look at the duster paper itself 
you definitely don't want to mine Bitcoin on a tiny box. That That's going to be a waste of your money. Bitcoin mining is already extremely specialized. Like a lot of the Bitcoin mining is happening on these like kind of like if you've ever heard of like an ant miner, there's there's ASICs. So there's basically you could think of it like a, a GPU that is specifically made for mining Bitcoin. That's what a Bitcoin ASIC such as the ant miner is. And it's not even that they're using that type of hardware, but also the Bitcoin miners are like they they put these Bitcoin mines in places where the electricity is really cheap, right? So for example, um, these Central Asian countries like Kazakhstan, they kind of like partially subsidize their electricity. So the government is like kind of paying for your electricity. So you put your Bitcoin mine there. I think there's also Bitcoin mines here in Texas because Texas has a bunch of natural gas and it actually has a ton of solar power too. So mining Bitcoin at your house using consumer electricity prices on hardware that is not intended to mine Bitcoin, you're just going to lose money. Yeah, you definitely don't don't want to uh, do that. Unless you live in Kazakhstan and you have a warehouse full of ant miners, then maybe it's worth doing that. But tiny box is going to be for fine-tuning uh, AI models and running your robot brain. All right, let's 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 do this little summary of 3D Gaussian splatting here because I think this will be a good way to get into the math a little bit. So each of these Gaussian splats, uh, and there's a whole set of them, right? A set, aka a bunch of these Gaussian splats, is parameterized by a mean vector in a covariance matrix to represent the view direction dependent, aka each of these Gaussian splats. If you're looking at it from this angle, it's got to have a different appearance than if you're looking at it from this angle. And if you're looking at it from this angle, right? Why would you want that? Because something's uh, changed. So for example, this little Apple iPods case, right? It's entirely white, but depending on where I'm looking at it, I'm gonna see the reflection of the light. So there's specific angles at which I look at this where it's gonna suddenly appear very bright and then I'm gonna change the view angle and it's gonna suddenly appear very dull. So in order to capture that view dependent color appearance, we're going to be using what's called spherical harmonics. That's what this SH is. And spherical harmonics, I have a picture that I show to kind of show you what this says, but it's basically a set of equations that allow you to uh, basically parameterize a function that is view dependent. So you can see here, you could imagine coefficients for each of these that allow you to say, okay, well, this little apple thing, if you're looking at it from the top, it's going to be more bright. And if you're looking at it from the bottom, it's going to be less bright, right? So that's what these uh, SH bases are, right? These BIs D there, where the D is the the uh, view dependence. And CI is going to be the color, which you're also going to be storing, right? So ultimately, the ith Gaussian is going to have a position x. It's going to have some spherical harmonic coefficients where your base color, kind of like your matte color is three RGB, but then you have your I all the one, two, all the way to N, depending on, you can have more or less, depending on how intense you want this SH coefficients to be, how good your view dependent color you want it to be. Opacity, opacity is just a single number that you can kind of think of it like the, the see-throughness of that individual Gaussian your rotation and your scaling. And this rotation and scaling are combined into the covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix is decomposed into these rotation and scaling here. And that's what a little Gaussian splat is. And a 3D Gaussian scene is going to be basically just a set of these. <clears throat> and this isn't actually uh, like always the same. So if you read different 3D Gaussian splatting papers, they'll have different parameters, right? So We've seen, for example, in the dynamic 3D Gaussians uh, papers, we have uh, m equations of motion, right? So you might have like a little velocity associated with each Gaussian. You might have uh, a rotation, uh, angular kind of uh, rotation, angular velocity as well, right? So you can add and remove properties to these Gaussians. And I think that as we move into the future, these are gonna uh, just get even more and more complex. People are gonna find more and more properties to assign to each of these Gaussians in order to give them all kinds of interesting properties. 
uh, I think just buying Bitcoin was always probably more profitable. Khalil, you are correct. And that is the whole point of Bitcoin is that you uh, should just buy it and store your money in there as a form of value. Store of value, I think, is the terminology we want. Yeah. Bear with me. I got to blow my nose a little bit. All right. So now uh, the next section in this paper basically introduces what Duster is. But I figured, why don't we just go to the original Duster paper itself? Because this paper is pretty awesome. And I also have another thing for you guys here. This is the actual Duster demo. So uh, I, I'm on my Windows computer right now because this is the one that has the whole streaming OBS setup. But I have a Linux computer with, I think it's a 3070. And I'm running the Duster demo, which actually just comes in their uh, GitHub. So you can literally go on their GitHub right here. Uh, where is it? Right here. Here's their GitHub. And this is it. This is the code. You can run the demo, and it's just a little grad I.O. demo. They have all the models there, and we're going to load it. So I'm going to I have some pictures here of my little robot. So I'm going to load up these pictures. I just took them with my cell phone. Right, and uh, I'm going to just hit run right there. And I didn't tell the uh, algorithm anything, right? So I'm not giving it any information other than just these pictures, right? So there's no notion of camera intrinsics here. It has no idea what camera I used to took, take this. And there's no notion of camera extrinsics here as well, right? So it doesn't really know what the position of each of these cameras was. So here you go, here are all the pictures. It's just uh, pictures of the little robot. And I actually took the pictures, I took some of them wide and some of them tall. So I also messed with that. I took like vertical shots and horizontal shots to see if it could deal with that. And it's pretty good, guys. Look at this. Look at this little... I mean, there's some stuff there that's a little sketch, but, like, that's pretty good for, like, whatever that was, like, 10 seconds, you know? That's that's pretty next level. And it even got, you see, look at the camera positions. So it figured out the camera intrinsics and the camera extrinsics and then gave us a pretty good little reconstruction there, a little good, good little structure. So that's what Duster is. So feel free to use that. But now that we've kind of hyped it up, let's actually go into the paper. So this is a paper that was released just at the end of last year. Uh, Neighbor Labs, Alto University, Duster, Geometric 3D Vision Made Easy. Multi-view stereo reconstruction first est estimates the camera parameters, aka intrinsic and extrinsics, which is usually tedious and cumbersome to obtain if you can even obtain them at all. So Duster is going to be doing this without prior information about camera, calib camera calibration nor viewpoint poises. So it doesn't know where you're taking these pictures from or what camera you're taking these pictures from. Uh, and kind of the magic of Duster is going to be coming from pre-trained transformers. So it's going to be using transformer models to encode and decode. And it's going to be using pre-trained transformer models that can leverage all the information in these big data sets. And we're gonna look at specifically the data sets that they use. And Duster gives us state of the art on monocular, which means single camera, multi-view depth estimation, as well as relative pose estimation. So Duster is kind of secretly the new state of the art, but people are kind of sleeping on it because it's not getting a ton of attention. So hopefully this video gives it a little bit more of that attention, which is well-deserved. Uh, all right, so in a nutshell, the task aims Unconstrained image-based dense 3D reconstruction from multiple views. This is kind of an exhaustive way of talking about what this exact task is. It's estimating the 3D geometry and camera parameters of a particular scene given a set of photographs of this scene. Not only does it have numerous applications, but it subsumes nearly all of the other geometric 3D vision tasks. And I think this is an important point here is that this kind of eats a whole set of tasks, right? And what they're what they mean is that this problem of unconstrained image-based 3D reconstruction from multiple views is basically impossible, right? <laughs> like for the longest time, it was really, really difficult. So people broke it down, right? Humans did what humans do, which is engineering. And engineering is taking a big, hard, hairy problem and breaking it into little problems. So people broke it into these little problems, such as feature extraction, bundle adjustment, image registration, geometric, like, and then they solved each of these little problems. So there's like multiple decades worth of computer vision papers where it's just like one paper that tries to find a better type of bundle adjustment, right? So 
coal map is kind of like the the pinnacle of that which is like hey we've basically aggregated all these different techniques and all the different papers and all the different best ways of doing each of these little things into one big pipeline right but the problem with this SFM and MVS pipelines like Colmap boil down to solving a series of minimal problems such as matching points, blah, blah, blah. This rather complex chain is quite unsatisfactory. Each sub-problem is not solved perfectly and adds noise to the next step, increasing the complexity and engineering effort required for the pipeline to work as a whole. So our superpower, which is engineering and breaking things down into sub-problems and then solving each of the sub-problems, kind of runs up to this limit where, okay, if you treat everything as a sub-problem and you solve each sub-problem independently, each little problem is almost kind of doomed from the start, right? Because this feature extraction can't benefit from anything that you learn in this bundle adjustment. There's not a good kind of flow of information. You can't help the solution to one problem by using kind of the information from a different problem. So when you solve all these problems separately, you're kind of introducing error a little bit here and that, that error messes with the error thing here and then that introduces a little bit more error which messes with this. So this kind of like accumulating error that happens from these very complicated pipelines that are um, modular and just a chain of already existing uh, minimal problems as they call it here. So Duster is a radically novel approach for dense, under-constrained, or unconstrained stereo 3D reconstruction from uncalibrated and unposed cameras. So it's a radically novel approach. Everybody loves radical research. Solving multiple minimal problems simultaneously, enabling the internal collaboration between them. And I think that's really the, the cool part to me is that by doing all of these problems at once, you kind of allow them to, to leach information into one another. And the benefit is that it's simpler, right? So... <laughs> One of the problems with this type of engineering uh, approach to research is that it gets more and more complicated, right? So every single one of these gets a little bit more complicated, right? An easy way to make something work a little bit better is to add another inductive bias and add a little another uh, regularization loss, another uh, extra little term here. And the problem with that is that you fast forward a decade and then the entire pipeline is so complicated that it's very difficult for anyone to understand, right? And being able to understand something is prerequisite to being able to expand on it. So we're kind of getting to the point in these structure for motion pipelines where it's very difficult to improve them any further because they've just gotten so complicated and there's so many different pieces that you need to understand. So whenever something solves all of that by doing it all at once and it does it in a very simple way, such as Duster, which is trained fully supervised using a simple regression loss, that's pretty good. Not enforcing any geometric constraints, so it literally removes a bunch of these inductive biases or constraints or assumptions that you're making based on your human intuition, and it ultimately works better and faster. We optimize the camera pose and geometry alignment directly in 3D space. Our approach unifies all 3D vision tasks and considerably simplifies over the traditional reconstruction pipeline, making Duster seem simple and easy in comparison. Our all-in-one model achieves state-of-the-art results on monocular and multi-view depth benchmarks, as well as multi-view camera pose estimation. So, I don't know about you guys, but just based on that intro right there, I'm extremely hyped, you know, because they're promising this is simpler, it's better, it's faster, it has less uh, biases, it's just better in every single fucking possible way you could think. All right, so let's see what it is. How's it going, Ed, and beyond? We're going to start with the definition of a point map. So what is a point map? A point map, X, is W by H by 3. So it's basically an image, but the 3 here doesn't refer to RGB. It refers to XYZ. So it's like a, it's like a point cloud where you also have the width and the height. So you're basically, it's like a point cloud, but like also an image at the same time, right? So a point cloud is just a set of points that are kind of unordered, kind of like a Gaussian splat, where the order of the points in the point cloud doesn't really mean anything. It's just a bunch of XYZ points, similar to a Gaussian splat, right? The order of the Gaussian splats doesn't necessarily mean anything. But a point map, the, the points are basically ordered row, 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 kind of like an image is. So it's like an image where you also know the 3D point that corresponds to every pixel. So put in a more mathematical way, a point map is a one-to-one -one mapping between image pixels and 3D scene points. 
right? And that's why it's called a point map because it maps from these image pixels, I, which have exist in some two-dimensional grid of width and height, which is your size of the image, and it maps to this three-dimensional set of points. Uh, okay, cameras and scene. So here's your camera intrinsic matrix. This is K, this is a three by three matrix, and your camera extrinsic matrix, which I think they don't define here, but that's a, also a matrix. Uh, blah, 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 three world to point camera poses. Okay, I think now we should look at figure two. So figure two shows their whole pipeline. And there's a lot of like math here, but it's actually a lot simpler than, than, uh, than it seems. So it looks like they're just kind of being a little bit verbose and they're kind of defining all the different things, which is good. You know, in, in any paper like this that introduces an entirely new thing, I'd love to see kind of like every single thing there where they're like, here's what every single symbol means and every single output and input to every single thing. That's very useful, but it can get a little bit uh, heavy to read all of it. So I think this visual picture here will give us the best idea. So architecture of the network F. This whole thing is the F network. Two views of a scene, I1 and I2. So here's your image I1. Here's an image which width by height by three. Here it is RGB. And then image I2 width by height by three. And that is also RGB. So you have two views of this cube right, from two different views. They're first encoded in a Siamese manner with a shared VIT encoder. That The Siamese manner here just refers to that these are the same. So you see this image is being cut into a bunch of patches because this is a VIT. A VIT is a vision transformer, which is a type of transformer model. And a transformer model is a sequence to sequence model, right? So it needs to consume a sequence of things. And in order to make this two-dimensional image a sequence of things, you're gonna patchify it, which basically means you're gonna cut it into these little patches and then feed it those little patches left to right, top to down, as if it was kind of like a sentence. So you're reading this image into a sentence of patches and that sentence of patches is being encoded by this VIT encoder. And it's called a Siamese because Siamese twins. I don't actually know what the origin of Siamese twins is. Maybe there was a famous twin from Siam, I think Siam is like a geographical place, but uh, basically these encoders are the same. So those encoders are gonna encode each of those images. They're gonna give you these Fs, which are called token representations, AKA just some vector representation that represents the image, right? And then pass to two transformer decoders that constantly exchange information via cross attention. So these two transformers here uh, inside this vision transformer encoder here, you have attention uh, blocks, but the attention blocks are performing self-attention. So they're basically doing an attention operation between all the tokens here and then all the tokens here. So attention with itself. These transformer decoders here, they're also a transformer. So they're also going to have an attention mechanism, except in this one, you're going to be doing cross attention. So you're going to be doing attention between this F that's coming in here and uh, attention and the F that's coming in there. So the attention computation is a cross attention, which is basically allowing information from F2 and F1 to kind of share, and they call this information sharing there, right? And that's the key. And with that information sharing there, you can then uh, ultimately get to these two heads here, regression heads. These regression heads are gonna output two corresponding point maps and associated confidence maps. So the output for this head and the output for this head is gonna be the same thing. This one's gonna have point map X11 and point map X21. So the notation there, XNM, the point map XN from camera N expressed in camera M's coordinate frame. So what they mean by that is that you don't know where any of these cameras are, right? You don't, you don't really have any of the camera positions. So what you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna just assume that one of these cameras, the first one, is gonna be the origin. So you're gonna say, okay, this camera here, I don't, I don't actually know which one is the first one. Which one is the first one, this yellow one? Okay, so this is the first pick. So this is gonna be the origin of my world. This little point right here, the, the fulcrum of this is gonna be the zero, zero, zero point. So then everything else is gonna be relative to that, right? So camera one is at the origin, camera two is at an unknown position, but rather than calculating the extrinsic matrix of camera one with respect to some other origin, camera one's extrinsic matrix is basically gonna be the identity, it's just sitting at the origin, and then camera two's extrinsic matrix is gonna be the position of camera two relative to camera one, right? So then 
because these point maps are ultimately giving you some three-dimensional point in space, that three-dimensional point in space is relative to some coordinate frame, and that coordinate frame is the camera one. Okay. So that's what a point map is here, your x11 and your x21. Then you're also going to be outputting this little thing here called a confidence. So if you can see this confidence, it has the same amount of numbers as w times h, but it only has one number there. So rather than being for every single uh, pixel in your image of width and height, you have three numbers which represent your x, y, z. In this case, you're just going to have one number, and that number is going to represent the confidence, which is basically going to be like, how confident am I in that this point is actually a good point and actually corresponds to the, the 3D geometry that I have in this scene versus it's just like some kind of throwaway point, right? So maybe here in this uh, image here, right, you can see that sometimes when I took a picture, there would be kind of like a shadow, right? Because because the way that the lighting was work, was behind me, like you can see this is the shadow of my arm. It's me holding the little picture, the cell phone. So some of the... Uh, some of the pixels here are dark green versus the same pixels in this image are light green, right? So that should be a kind of a low confidence uh, score in your point map because you're going to have kind of a weirdness there where in one thing it's going to be slightly darker green because I was like just holding the camera and, and the shadow of my body was creating a slightly darker color. So having that confidence allows you to make this a little bit more fuzzy and allow it to ultimately end up at a better solution. The network F is trained using a simple regression loss, which we're going to look at. Uh, okay, this is basically what we just saw. You have the two RGB images, two corresponding point maps. You also output these confidence maps. Both point maps are expressed in the same coordinate frame of I1, which is the first image. So again, everything is going to be respect or uh, with respect to the camera one at the origin. Uh, both images have the same resolution. And then here we're going to get into the actual uh, neural network. So these actual vision I transformers here, where are they coming from, right? So what do they start with? They said in the beginning here that they leverage pre-trained models. Okay, so pre-trained means that someone already trained them. And they're going to be using specifically Croco. So two identical branches, each consisting an image encoder, decoder, and regression head, weight sharing, VIT encoders. And let's take a little tangent here into Croco. So what is Croco? This is Croco. Croco released the 12th of January, 2023. Croco self-supervised pre-training for a 3D vision task by cross-view completion. I think that's where the crow comes from. It's Croco, cross-view completion, cross. So it's, I guess, completion. So cro cross, cro-ca. Krakow? Is that, I guess, the way to say it? I don't know. Either way, this is actually a relatively simple paper, so we can explain it in almost like a minute here. So let's go ahead and do that. Masked image modeling is a pre-training paradigm, so it's a type of pre-training, where you mask patches in an input image, and this mask content is then predicted by a neural network using visible patches as the sole input. So you start with pairs of images showing the same scene from different viewpoints. So here's, here's a little figure. You have uh, some picture of this, whatever this is, this like church somewhere, I would guess, or some old building in Europe. And you're going to mask part of it. So you see, you're going to take your image and then you're going to say, okay, I'm going to zero out these parts here. So you don't know what those are. And then you're going to have to predict those. So I'm going to tell my little vision transformer that here's what the input is. And I want you to basically predict the missing or the masked patches. Okay. But... I'm not just going to give you nothing to do that. I'm also going to give you this reference view. So this picture and this picture, they're both pictures of the same thing, but they're from different views. And because they're from different views, they're also going to have slightly different appearance, right? So you can't just kind of naively say, okay, well, this this is the same red brick as this same red brick because it seems like the color is a little bit different now, right? Everything's kind of a little bit different. So it makes it more of a difficult problem. And because it's a slightly more difficult problem, they, I really like the way that they put it here. The model learns to act as a prior influenced by high-level semantics. So the model basically learns how to take this image and this image and encode it in such a way that it figures out some high-level semantic, which is 
a fancy way of saying it's it's working at a higher level space of like oh there's a window here right it has like this high level semantic notion of a window and this window has uh two panels one on top of the other right so it's like it's building this high level semantic uh, notion of what the window is, and then it allows that to go all the way back into the low-level features and actually build that target view of that window, right? And and there you go. So you can see that it reconstructs this view from the reference view, and that's a simple pre-training task that you can use with a massive data set, and you run that for long enough, and you end up with really good little vision transformer encoders, and that's what Croco is. So with any kind of uh, pre-training uh, uh, paper like this, the the actual transformer architecture, the masked image modeling, like that stuff isn't really important. What's ultimately gonna uh, determine the quality of this type of stuff is the data set, right? So any deep learning model like is ultimately just, ultimately just kind of compressing the data set that is trained on. It's almost just like a compressed form of the data set that you've trained on. So I scrolled down until I found the data set, and here we go. This is the actual part where they explain what they trained on. So Croco is implemented in PyTorch. It's just a simple VIT base 16. The 16 is the number of patches. So patches is again when you break it into these little squares each of those is a patch so 16 tells you the number of those patches and uh, the VIT base is a vision transformer the base stands for the size of it there's different sizes of vision transformers there's VIT small VIT large so base is kind of just like kind of the medium size I, I suppose the base size and the pre-training data set which is the most important part is synthetic image pairs of 3d indoor scenes derived from these data sets. So you have ScanNet, Replica, Replica CAD, HM3D, and all of these are being synthetically rendered in Habitat Simulator. Okay. And ultimately you're gonna have about two million of these pairs. So the Croco paper is basically just masked image modeling for pre-training a VIT image encoder. And it's done using synthetic renders of indoor scenes using the Habitat Simulator. So the Habitat Simulator is a simulation environment, a platform, I guess, created by Facebook. So Facebook Meta does a ton of uh, kind of uh, computer vision type stuff. And this is like basically just indoor scenes that you can move around, right? Uh, the examples here are all about embodied research. So the the point of Habitat, at least when it was released, was to basically create an environment where you can train like a home robot and kind of train it to do things. But that's not what these guys use it for. These guys just use it to get these synthetic image pairs, right? So they basically want pairs where you're like, okay, these two images here are images of the same thing, but from slightly different views. So this simulator is a very convenient way of doing that where you can basically say, okay, well, I'm going to take this picture and then I want to move a little bit over here and take a picture of the same thing, but from a different view. So that's, that's, that's where all the information is coming from, right? So just to summarize, AI Habitat, which is a simulation environment created by Facebook, is being used to render images, synthetic paired images of HM3D, ScanNet, Replica, and Replica CAD, in order to train a vision transformer encoder using a masked image modeling loss in order to initialize the vision transformers that are used for Duster. So that's that's kind of the, the path that the information took to get to these VIT encoders that are really good at giving you these token representations, F1 and F2 here, that encode all this kind of high level semantic information about like what am I actually looking at and from what angle am I looking at it from? Okay. Uh, so you have your encoder decoder. Your decoder is a generic transformer network equipped with cross attention. Again, most of the magic is happening in this encoder here, right? Which is getting most of the magic from that mass image modeling pre-training. Each decoder block attends to tokens from the other block. This is the cross attention here. Uh, and then you have your regression heads that take the set of decoder tokens and output a point map and an associated confidence map. Okay. 
Uh, our generic architecture never explicitly enforces any geometrical constraints. Hence, point maps do not necessarily co correspond to any physical plaus physically plausible camera model. Using a generic architecture allows us to leverage strong pre-training techniques, ultimately surpassing what existing task-specific architectures can achieve. And this is really the story of deep learning, right? The story of deep learning is moving away from these types of over-engineered approaches. And I call them over-engineered not because the people that made them were stupid, because the people that made these things are very smart, but this boils down to the Rich Sutton bitter lesson again, right? Where Rich Sutton's bitter lesson is that humans will always try to add more constraints, more inductive biases, more ways of kind of adding their intuition and knowledge into a specific algorithm so that it works better. But deep learning kind of flipped that on its head and said, okay, well, actually, you don't want to rely on these constraints and biases that are coming from a human engineer. Instead, just provide a huge data set and learn the best uh, structure from that, right? Learn the best hierarchy of features from that. Don't learn, don't try to force anything on it, just learn it from a bunch of data. And Duster is basically that type of mentality, but applied to this multi-view uh, reconstruction or structure from motion problem where, okay, let's get rid of all these geometric priors, all these geometric constraints that people have been curating and improving on for years and years and years. Let's just wipe the board clean. We're just going to have a VIT encoder. It's just going to encode multiple image views. And then we're just going to have a little decoder here. And it's just going to directly output a point map with some confidence. And that's it, right? And if you explain this to some computer vision researcher in the, in the 1990s or in the 2000s, they would be like, that doesn't correspond to any physically plausible camera model. That doesn't make any fucking sense. And you're like, you know what? It doesn't need to make any sense because we have deep learning now and it creates this magical black box vision transformer here that just knows what it knows and we can rely on that. Okay. Uh, training objective. 3D regression law. So if you remember here, they say a uh, they use a simple regression loss. They mentioned that multiple times here. Simple regression loss, simple regression loss. Okay, well, let's see how simple it really is. Our sole training objective is based on regression in the 3D space. Let us denote the ground truth point maps, X11 and X21. So ground truth point maps means point maps that you actually know what the depth is. You're only going to be able to do that if it's a synthetic data set or it's a uh, data set that has explicit depth. Maybe you had some kind of structured light sensor, some kind of LIDAR that gives you that explicit depth. But even if you don't have that, uh, monocular depth estimation is so good right now. I would recommend looking at the Marigold streams that we've done that you could probably take any existing data set and run it through this Marigold depth and then get a ground truth depth that would allow you to treat that as the point map or the ground truth of the point map. But ultimately, the regression loss that they're going to be using for each individual pixel and at each individual view is going to be this Euclidean distance. So extremely simple. Basically, they're going to say, okay, well, here's where the point was, and then here's where the point that you predicted ended up being. So I'm going to take that ground truth point, and I'm going to take the predicted point, and I'm just going to literally minus them, and that's it. It's an L1 Euclidean distance. That's it. They do a little bit of fancy stuff here, so they normalize by averaging all the distance of the valid points. So that normalization is going to help because, you know, some data sets, the, the points are going to be meters apart, and in other data sets, the points are going to be inches apart, right, depending on if you have a data set of just, like, little tiny objects or a data set of, like, big churches. So normalizing all the points so that they're basically just nicely shaped allows you to do this a little bit cleaner. And then they're also going to make this a confidence aware loss, which basically means that this L regression loss right here, this simple Euclidean distance loss right here, they're going to be multiplying it by this CIV1, which is a confidence score for the pixel I, where alpha is some hyperparameter. I don't like to see these hyperparameters, but I guess you got to do what you got to do, which strictly enforces positive concepts confidence, which has the effect of forcing the network to extrapolate in harder areas like the ones covered by a single view. So the confidence, which is actually one of the outputs of the head right here, right, this C1 of dimension W by H, is going to be basically multiplying 
this regression loss, which is a Euclidean distance. So relatively simple. I don't know if I would call it the simplest possible regression loss because you have this notion of a confidence score, right? It'd be kind of cool if you didn't have this confidence, but that's not too bad. In the world of computer vision uh, pipelines, that's actually quite clean. Uh, all right, that's basically it here. I think that the next part of this downstream application, so as they mentioned, here, right, this subsumes nearly all of the other geometric 3D vision tasks. So pretty much the entire rest of this paper is just destroying every other uh, type of computer vision task. So they go through all of these computer vision tasks, whether it's point matching, recovering intrinsic camera information, relative pose estimation, absolute pose estimation, pairwise graph, uh, Experiments, here we go, where is it? Monocular depth estimation, multi-view pose estimation. So for every single one of these, uh, visual localization, they basically give you, okay, so here are some data sets that are about this problem. So for example, monocular depth is the problem of reconstruct, giving your, given an image, find the depth associated with each of the pixels in that. Here are some data sets to do that. DDAD, Kitty, NYU V2, Bon, Tum. The uh, errors or the quantitative metrics that are used to judge and analyze monocular depth tasks are absolute relative error and prediction threshold accuracy. The multi view pose estimation, they're going to use Co3D or Co3DV2 and Real Estate 10K. And then for multi view pose estimation, you're going to be using relative rotational accuracy and relative translational accuracy and mean average accuracy. So there's like basically this giant swath and collection of different uh, tasks. And for each of those tasks, you're gonna have a different set of metrics and they're pretty exhaustive at every single one. So you got multi-view depth, 3D reconstruction. And for pretty much all of these, they get state-of-the-art. So outperforms supervised or self-supervised baselines and performs on par with state-of-the-art results. Okay, best overall performance on the two data sets and significantly surpasses state-of-the-art, okay pretty good right so they, like they kind of go and they they just kill every single there's some that it doesn't quite so for example this one here 3d reconstruction our method does not reach the accuracy level of the best methods but in our defense these methods all leverage ground truth poses and train specifically on the dtu train set whenever applicable so they don't quite get beat out by super overfit methods that literally train on the data set that you're supposed to be evaling on but if you can get kind of as good as a paper without even training on this data set, that to me shows that you're pretty state of the art, right? Uh, and then this monstrous table here, here's all the different uh, Kitty, ScanNet, E3D, DTU, TNT, all the different uh, metrics here. And you can kind of see compared to Colmap and then Duster. So lower is better. 9.11 versus 12. Let's go here. DTU, relative. Lower is better. 0 0.7. Ooh, this is no good. 3.52. I guess this is DTU, though, so that's what the one that they were saying, where in our defense, we don't train on DTU. What about TNT? TNT, 2.7. Lower is better. 3.17. Not quite as good, so maybe there's a little bit. Maybe we were drinking the Kool-Aid too much. Each ETH 3D... Tau, higher is better, 55, 76. Okay, so it does beat on a bunch of these, but really the magic is this, is that Colmap requires ground truth pose and ground truth intrinsics, but Duster requires nothing. You don't need ground truth pose. You don't need ground truth extrinsics. You don't need anything. You just give it a bunch of pictures and it just figures it all out. And it does it really fast. So you see Colmap takes about three minutes here. Look at this, 0 0.13 minutes. So Duster is really, really fast. You don't need a bunch of this other crap, and it performs either state-of-the-art or close enough to state-of-the-art. And that is basically Duster. I did want to try this. So I'm, we're going to try this live because I, I'm, I want to see what happens. So we're going to close out of all of this, and here's what I'm going to do. I have two pictures, but these are actually pictures that 
that uh, don't work together. So I have one picture where the robot's arms are like this, and then I have one picture where the robot's arms are like this. So technically, the scene has changed, right? I changed the scene halfway through. And I want to see what happens when you give it two pictures where they don't actually correspond to the same underlying scene. So you see that the arms aren't correct. This, these arms are down. These arms are up. So what's, what's going to happen in that case? Let's see. I actually didn't do this, so I wonder what's happening. Yeah, you see it doesn't, it doesn't solve it. So it actually kind of gets confused. It, it matches the center of the robot, but then the two arms, it kind of just gives you both of the arms. This arm, it kind of like does like an in-between. So that's kind of interesting. We found the weak point. I mean, this isn't necessarily a weak point because every other paper would also suffer from this issue, but you know, I'm always down to see what happens with weird edge cases. Uh, all right, this is still the duster paper, just showing you more and more results. Pretty awesome, look at that, two camera views from two sides and it just magically figures out the correspondences. It's going to be very good at indoor scenes because it's been trained on this AI habitat, right? So that's kind of an obvious thing that it's going to be good at. Pretty good. Let's go back to our instant splat. Okay, so we took a quite a long little tangent there to talk about duster. And now we're gonna go, this is the duster, blah, 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 it's getting us these point maps. It's using the Weiss field algorithm to calculate per camera focal. So this is how it gets the focal, which is the one of the camera intrinsic parameters, right? So the camera intrinsic parameters are those properties of the camera. The focal is one of the properties of the camera. And it does this with this Weiss field. I found like a nice little visualization for this. So this guy has great visualizations, Gabrielle Peyray. And this is a nice little visualization of what Wastefield's algorithm is. Pretty cool. I could watch this all day, <laughs> but not actually. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're covering camera extrinsics pairwise to global aligned poses. Duster only takes image pairs as input. It's fine, that's fine. Okay, this part here fast 3D Gaussian optimization. So if you remember, the instant splat has two parts. It has this sparse coarse geometric initialization, which is effectively duster, right? Which is, okay, you have your images. You don't have the pose. You don't have the intrinsic for those. Give me some final initialization of these poses and uh, point maps, which is going to be the output of this, aka a globally aligned point cloud or a bunch of points that are all relative to some global reference frame. And now we're going to do the second part of this, which is going to be the 3D Gaussian splatting part, which is going to be the fast 3D Gaussian optimization. And it's kind of half-half, so 20 seconds for this first part, about 16 seconds for this second part. And that's this is going to depend on the number of pictures, right? So if you have a thousand pictures, this is obviously going to take much longer than if you had two pictures. So I think this 20 seconds corresponds to three pictures probably. Or maybe not, I don't actually know. But the second part, this fast 3D Gaussian optimization, that's gonna be kind of what we're looking at here. Fast 3D Gaussian optimization. Uh, traditional, initial, traditional initialization pipelines. with sparse point clouds from structure for motion provide basic color and positional details. So structure for motion provides basic color and positional details. That's what you're getting here. In the original Gaussian splat paper, you're starting from this SFM points, which is just a point cloud. So every single one of these points just has an XYZ position and maybe you're fancy and you have a, a color RGB. So you have six numbers for each of these points, the XYZ and then the RGB, which is kind of a primitive type of color, right? That's what they mean by basic color because these guys are using fancy color, right? They're using the color combined with the spherical harmonics for that view dependence. So a little bit fancier. Uh, the inherent sparsity of SFM data demands extensive optimization, time to densify, split, and refine Gaussians for adequate 3D scene modeling. That's going to be that 
uh, adaptive density control that we're talking about that you have to do because you're going to have to add more Gaussians or remove Gaussians, densifying, splitting, which means taking a Gaussian, turning it into two Gaussians, utilizing a globally aligned point map as a preliminary scene geometry, replacing the sparse SFM point set for 3D GS initialization. So in InstaSplat, they're going to re replace that whole coal map SFM crap with the duster. This approach minimizes the need for manual optimizations, omitting the densification, splitting, and opacity reset processes, thereby streamlining and simplifying the optimization procedure. Jointly optimizing poses and attributes. Ambiguities arise due to inaccuracies in predicted points or confidence maps, so we introduce a constraint to ensure that the optimized poses do not deviate excessively from their initial positions. Here's the constraint that they pose. S is the set of 3D Gaussians. T is the camera extrinsics, which is like the camera poses, right? So they're jointly trying to optimize the Gaussian parameters themselves and the camera extrinsics, aka the camera positions. And T0 is the initial one. So this is the T0, so the original camera positions plus, or the camera positions now minus the original camera positions. The original camera positions are the ones that are coming out of Duster. So they're they're just going to like try to move a little bit. So they're, it's not like they're taking the camera positions that Duster gives them, right? It's not like they're taking these two camera positions, which Duster gives you, right? Duster's going to give you some extrinsic camera positions and just throwing them away, right? They're going to say, okay, those, those are going to be pretty good, but they're not going to be perfect. So because they're not going to be perfect, we're going to uh, always, we're going to have this little term here that tries to prevent uh, the original camera position from drifting or the, the camera position from drifting too far from that guess that was given to us by Duster. Okay. Uh, C is the rendering function. So in this case, the rendering function is this, uh, for Gaussian splats, you're using like a radix sort. I think they have a definition here, optimization. Let's go down to the rendering. Uh, so this is the original Gaussian, uh, Gaussian splat paper. Basically, it's a fully differentiable rendering, and that's important because in order to push gradients, so ultimately you're going to be looking at the image that comes out of your rendering process from your Gaussian splatting, and you're going to be using that image to compare it to the real image that you want and then push a gradient based on that. So because you want to push a gradient, you're going to have to push a gradient through this part right here, which is the rendering Part. So the renderer needs to be differentiable, which means you need to be able to take the derivative of that such that you can chain rule all the way back to what you really want, which is the Gaussians themselves, right? Like ultimately you want the gradient to go all the way back into the little Gaussians so that you can change the little parameters of the Gaussians, these things here, right? So that rendering function needs to be differentiable. Luckily for us in Gaussian splatting, it is. And if you want more details about that, it's basically here, but it's basically they pre-sort the pixels. So like that's why Gaussian splatting is fast is because this sorting is actually really fast. So they sort them based on the view position. So they based on where you're looking at, at this set of Gaussians, you sort them all from a distance to the camera. You're doing this sorting. I think it sorts it into these, so it sorts all of them, but it does it per tile. And then, uh, Rather than traversing an explicit list of progressively shrinking opacities in the backward pass, we can recover intermediate opacities by storing only the total accumulated opacity at the end of the forward pass. Let's see if there's any other things here. Single fast GPU radix sort. That's the word I was looking for. But basically you're kind of like overlapping all these little Gaussians and because they have that opacity, right? These little Gaussians have that opacity here this opacity alpha, the ones that are close to you are going to kind of, you're going to see them more than the ones that are behind that one and behind that one and behind that one. And at some point, the way that the opacities work, you're not going to be able to see past a certain Gaussian and you don't have to worry about kind of rendering the ones after that. That's a pretty uh, coarse uh, explanation of how the rendering for Gaussians works. But if you're interested, this, this uh, original paper and the original stream where we go through this should be what you look at. Uh, okay, but you have your rendering, it's taking in your Gaussians and it's taking in your camera positions. That's ultimately giving you an image and then you're kind of basically subtracting those images and using a reconstruction 
accuracy or reconstruction loss to push gradients all the way back into the camera poses and the Gaussian parameters. Question from Olorin. Are there any works on combining Gaussian splatting and nerfs? I can't think of any off the top of my head, but there definitely is. There's like literally hundreds and hundreds of papers on nerfs and hundreds of papers on Gaussian splatting. And there are definitely like, I th I don't I, like I said, I can't remember any off the top of my head, but I've definitely seen papers that like play with ideas from both. So they have a little bit of ideas of the Gaussian splatting, a little bit of ideas of nerves, combining them in kind of like interesting, weird ways. So I wish I had something to, to give you exactly, but yeah, there you go. Jizong Peng Rad Splat. Let's see. Rad Splat. Radiance Field Informed Gaussian Splatting. There you go. Google Paper. Nice. So here's your here's your little nerf. All right. So I'm I'm looking at this for the first time ever too, right? So <laughs> don't judge me. Uh, you have your voc you have your volume of space. You have multi view cameras. So here you have different cameras looking at this scene. Here you have your nerf, right? A nerf is a little multi-layer perceptron that takes in the position of the camera. It takes in the, the view direction. So these are kind of like extrinsic camera information. And then it's projecting these rays. And then as the ray intersects this volume of space, uh, you can query the nerf at each of these points, right? A nerf is a neural field so it's a neural network that defines a field. A field is just a function that you can evaluate at any point in space. So that includes all of these points here along this ray. So for the NERF, you're feeding this camera extrinsic information into this little multilayer perceptron. That little multilayer perceptron is ultimately giving you a color and a opacity. And that color and opacity, there's also a uh, differentiable rendering process with nerfs that allows you to take this reconstruction loss here where you have some ground truth color and the predicted color and back propagate all the way in this case you're not back propagating into the gaussian parameters which is the explicit 3d representation that is a 3d gaussian in this case you're back propagating into the weights of this little neural net here which is an implicit 3D representation. And that's really the key difference between a nerf and a Gaussian splat is that a Gaussian splat is explicit, which means that it's like literally those points are the thing, right? It's just these, this set of Gaussian splats is the object that you're trying to capture in 3D versus in a nerf, you just have this little neural net and, and you're like, what the, what the fuck is this little neural net? And you're like, okay, well actually this little neural net, if you just ask it to give you the color of the object from any point in this volume, it'll give it'll give you that color, right? So the the nerf is more like a little function that you can evaluate and then get ultimately get an image from that, but it's not an explicit representation of the 3D object in the sense that a Gaussian splat is. So okay, now let's actually see what the hell this is. Rad splat. So in rad splat, it seems like they're using the nerf to initialize the Gaussian splat, and then the Gaussian splat, here's a nerf-based supervision. Okay, so then, okay, I think I see what's going on here. All right, so basically what it seems like it happens is they train a nerf, and then they use the nerf to initialize the Gaussian splatting. So not only are they initializing, probably using opacity, so they probably uh, use the opacity as a proxy for the density of the object. So if the opacity is really high, right, this number here, this, uh, uh, little variable here. If that is really high, it means that the object is like dense, which means that there's something there. And if there's something there, I should probably initialize a little Gaussian there. So that's probably how the initialization is happening. And then not only that, but then they're also using their little nerf, which is this little function that they can evaluate in order to supervise or basically provide uh, the target of like, hey, this is what it should look like from this view. And then the Gaussian splatting, you can run it from that, right? So it's kind of cool, but you know, if you can just, uh, cause in or the problem with this, 
is that in order to train this nerf, you're going to need a bunch of these views and you're going to need to know exactly where these were taken from, right? So the, the, you're, you're not running away from the problem, which is that you don't have the camera information for each of these little cameras. You don't have the intrinsic, you don't have the extrinsic, right? I'm just some random guy taking pictures of my robot, right? I didn't tell you anything about where these cameras are. I didn't tell you any information about the extrinsic. So that's the issue with this is that you're, you would need the extrinsic camera information. You would need the intrinsic camera information, and you would probably also need a lot more views in order to build a good nerve compared to Duster, where I can just give it two views and it's fine. So that's my three-minute summary of this paper that I haven't read, so I apologize if I completely missed the point. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, where were we at? Okay, so we just finished the explanation of this one here, the globally aligned 3D Gaussian. So the second part of this two-part two pipeline that is instant splat. And after that, we pretty much, I think that's pretty much most of the paper. After this, they basically just kind of uh, go through the evaluation part. The evaluation part, they just kind of tell you what data sets they used, what scores they got, so this is the tanks and temples and then MV ImageNet data sets. They select 12 views for training and 12 views for evaluation. And the metrics, aka the scores that you're gonna use to determine whether this function this works better than other methods is called absolute trajectory error, relative pose error, peak signal to noise ratio, PSNR, structural similarity index measure, SSIM, and then learn perceptual image patch similarity or LPIPs. I don't, these ones like I cringe every time for PSNR, SSIM, LPIPs because people use these because they're they're just a formula. You can just, for some of these, you're kind of using a little bit of neural networks just to give you some feature vectors and then comparing those feature vectors. But they're not true quality metrics. I think subjective quality metrics such as human tests where you have human evaluators sit there and look at pictures and tell you which picture is better. I think that's the gra the like gold standard for quality. But not everyone has the money and the time to do these human evaluator studies, so they rely on these quantitative metrics. But I always feel the need to go into this little rant whenever I see these quantitative metrics that these aren't don't take these as ground truth. So like if, if you're slightly worse on SSIM or slightly better on PSNR, like that's not the end of the day, right? But let's see what we're talking about here. So they're comparing to CF3DGS, Nope Nerf, and ours, 28 compared to 18 compared to 23. So higher is better. So like I'm saying here, so 18 compared to 23, like, eh, I don't really know. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like it could, like either way, but 28 compared to 18, now we're talking, you know, now that that seems kind of significant. 0 0.89, 0 0.59, 0 0.68. Yeah, it does seem significantly better, but also these are not necessarily the, the latest and greatest, right? So they're kind of probably picking on the small kids in the in the playground here with CF3DGS and Nope Nerve. All right, let's look at the qualitative because I think that's more important. Yeah, this is the, this is from their, we should actually just look at this on their website because I think it's better right here. So yeah, this is the one that is, is crazy. So look at the look at the geometry on that little like bicycle rack. So much cleaner. Like unbelievably cleaner. Right? That's that's absolutely crazy. But again, I don't actually know. I think nope nerf is probably just some D tier nerf paper. So <laughs> They're probably just comparing to the easy stuff. Uh, all right, let's keep going here. Is there anything else? Trained in PyTorch. Duster trained with the resolution of 512 with a VIT large encoder and a VIT base decoder and trained on one NVIDIA A100. The A100 is like the workhorse of the computer vision world. Like everybody loves these A100s. They're the perfect mix of strong but also relatively cheap. Do some ablation studies here. What are they ablating? The impacting of averaging focal length. Utilizing the average focal length for subsequent global alignment. Not averaging focal 
full model, right? So this is kind of like the ablation. This is what I'm talking about when I mean that like these are almost meaningless. Like what, what the fuck does 28.58 PSNR compared to 27.18 PSNR? Like what? Can, can, is, does that actually mean anything? Or is that like, I don't know. I'm being nitpicky. 26 versus 28. So full model versus this joint optimization. I think the joint optimization is this part here where they're also optimizing for the T, right? It could be the, what they could have done is they could have just separated this compl completely where they just take the camera positions that come out of Duster and then just use those as ground truth for this 3D Gaussian uh, optimization process, but they don't do that, right? They, they decide to also optimize the camera poses a little bit as with this uh, uh, regularization here that prevents them from drifting too far away from the original duster guess. So here in this ablation, they're basically saying, okay, remove that. So we only optimize the Gaussians, no joint optimization, or we optimize the Gaussians and we allow the camera poses to change a little bit. And you can see that it, it does make it a little bit better, but again, it's just like 28 versus 26. 80.89 versus 0.85, like very, very difficult to really, really say with certainty that it's actually leading to anything. Okay. In conclusion, superior rendering and quality and pose estimation accuracy compared to existing methodologies. Instant Splat is basically just 3D Gaussian splatting, but with duster. And that's why this paper really isn't that long. It's just 11 pages. Compare that to uh, the Duster paper. It's 23 pages. Compare that to, uh, for example, the original Gaussian Splat paper is 14. So not much to it, but it's a really good... It kind of paints a good picture, right? Because what you're seeing is, and it's coming all the way... Actually, let me... Let me I'll summarize it because I, I kind of want to... I feel like it's a better way. I'm not, there's no point in summarizing and then doing a summary afterwards. So let me take a break here. Let me sip this yerba mate and then I'll answer any questions you guys have and then we will summarize the stream. All right, so... Joshna Minaj is, you're, you're very persistent <laughs> with what you want to do here. Is yerba mate better than coffee? Yes and also no. So one of the, one of the things is that when people drink yerba mate, sometimes they drink with uh, these things. So these are called bombas. This is like the traditional way of drinking yerba mate where you basically pack all your yerba mate into this little like gourd. And the first time you try this, it feels absolutely amazing. But the reason is that you're putting so much yerba mate into this thing that compared to like a coffee, which you're, has like 100 milligrams of caffeine, this is like 300 milligrams of caffeine. Like you're blasting yourself with caffeine. So a lot of people, when they first go from drinking coffee and then they suddenly try yerba mate, they're like, holy shit, this is so much stronger. This is so much better. But really it's because they're just using a huge amount of yerba mate and they're not used to consuming that much caffeine. So it feels amazing to them, right? But if you were to drink the same amount of coffee, you would also feel amazing, right? But if you're just using a normal amount of yerba mate, it's kind of on par it's a little it's kind of like the difference between tea and coffee where it's a little bit more rounded it has like i think it's the l-theanine in it that makes it a little bit more rounded less anxious so i kind of prefer it but it's not like way way better than coffee uh back to what do you have in terms of gpu for your projects I have a bunch of 30 GPUs. So I have like a 3090, I have two 3070s, I have a 3060. I also have older generations. So I have two 1080s, I have a 1070. I have basically GPUs that I've accumulated over my lifetime. And I have like right there, right behind me, basically there's like five computers, five PC computers, most of them running Linux, except for this one that's running Windows. 
and yeah that's good enough for doing the little things I do here and there I generally don't do super intensive training projects but if I want to do something like that I would just go on the cloud and, and rent uh, A100s do you get your yerba mate from anywhere in the local Austin area or online I just get it from the grocery store there's fancy places there's there's actually a guy who like was trying to promote a yerba mate brand he like came on one of my streams and like told me to use a specific type of yerba mate that like he grows or something like that but i don't know don't have a yerba mate supplier yet question from magus magnus are you using some deep learning method to keep your eyes focused towards the audience or is it just me seeing things no i i am there it's called nvidia nvidia eyes let's see nvidia broadcast that's what it's called it basically creates these virtual eyes and you can actually see it. So if I get really close to the camera and I go like this, you see that? Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I don't know. I don't really necessarily care about like the eye contact, but I thought it was pretty cool to have like a weird filter on me. So yeah, I added that. Uh, would love to stream a stream on the latest prompt engineering stuff for your practitioner fans out there. Yeah, I mean, prompt engineering, like, I know people meme on it a lot, and, you know, I think that memeing actually comes from a place of gatekeeping. I think a lot of the people who had to, who learned, like, official programming languages they look at prompt engineering and they're like, wow, that's not a real programming language, but that's what it is, right? Prompt engineering is basically a new type of programming that's entirely a natural language. And I, I actually think that that's the, the kind of programming language of the future where your ability to be able to say what you want to a computer that is kind of understanding you entirely in natural language and doing that effectively is effect is kind of the same thing as learning Python or learning any other programming language where you're just learning how to take what's in your brain and put it in such a way that a computer can understand it. So I see prompt engineering as the successor to Python, right? If you compare Python to something like C++, Python almost reads like English, right? And the, the the reason that people started using Python is because it's closer to natural language than something like C++, which is more difficult and abstract. So I think prompt engineering is the successor to Python, but like I said, a lot of people, they, they, they're sour and they have this kind of gatekeeping attitude. And to them, they spent all this time learning Python. So they're upset that someone can come in there and be like, hey, I, I just code in natural language, right? I'm just good at knowing how to write my intentions in natural language so that a language model can understand what I want, right? So it's really a type of programming or coding that's entirely in natural language, but right now it's still in its very early stages. We still really don't know the good way of doing it, the bad way of doing it. You're starting to see some people that are getting quite good at it, and they're getting quite good at understanding. You're seeing people who have these like setups where they basically like... Uh, programmatically try different types of prompts until they figure out the one that works. I think that's the best way to do it. So ultimately for a programming language like Python or C++, it's like you, there's a specific way of doing it that's optimal. And that, that depends on a, on a, on this whole kind of art and science of, of heuristics and data structures and algorithms. And you kind of need to know those, but for prompt engineering, it's much more nebulous, right? And the way to know whether a prompt is optimal is is almost more, you're going to have to discover that empirically. You're going to have to basically try a bunch of prompts and then figure out, okay, this one seems to work better. So I think it's a, it's a very early type of programming language of which the optimal solutions are going to be the result of basically empirical studies, which is kind of a weird way of getting to the optimal solution for a programming language, right? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's cool, but I, I'm definitely not like a S tier prompt engineer. I'll tell you guys that right off the bat. I just kind of, I have my own kind of like magic and art that I kind of use and I think it makes it work better, but for all I know, it could literally be making it worse. <laughs> 
Uh, are there any advantages to nerfs over Gosh and Splats? Uh, question from Olorin. There is an advantage to a nerf. So here's the advantage of nerfs is that this is very small. So in a nerf, the only thing you have is this little multi-layer perceptron. So this little multi-layer perceptron is tiny. I can send that to you in a text message, right? So maybe for specific, maybe like a VR application, right? So you're doing, you have a VR headset and the VR headset is very small and very tiny and that little tiny chip in that VR headset can really only do a very, very small amount of compute. In that situation, right? And maybe you're using it over internet that is super shitty. You're using it over some kind of like Starlink, but you're in the middle of nowhere. In that point, sending someone a, a little tiny multi-layer perceptron nerf and then rendering that, that might actually be better because it's very small. So it can be sent very efficiently and it's also very small. So you can load it into your little tiny chip on your VR headset. So the fact that it's very small because it's a very compressed, it's a very implicit compressed representation of your 3D thing. That's kind of to me the big advantage of the nerf. It's also because it's implicit, it it's better at modeling like weird things like like smoke and translucent objects and like weird kind of things like that, like amorphous objects versus a Gaussian splat being much more explicit, right? it's much bigger. So if you want to send someone a Gaussian splat, it's going to be a bigger file, right? If you want to load a Gaussian splat, it's going to be a bigger file. If you want to uh, do any kind of smoke or fire or any kind of like weird thing like that, you're, it's going to be more weird to use Gaussian splats because you're literally going to be using these little ellipsoids to kind of like make it look like smoke when it would be, you would achieve that effect much nicer in a nerf. So there are some advantages to nerf, but I just think that the Gaussian splats, the explicit nature of them, makes them so much easier to kind of compose and you can remove this object and add this object and move around. And like, I think that Gaussian splats are going to win because they're explicit, but the explicitness comes with the heaviness of having to transfer and send files around. Uh, okay. Magnus Kumar just installed an old AIO liquid cooler on a Tesla M40. Pretty cool, man. I don't have liquid. I have a liquid cooled CPU on one of my machines, but I don't have a liquid cooled GPU. If you're into liquid cooling, you should look into mineral oil PCs. If you've ever seen these before. So there's like this whole uh, community of people that they take their PC and then they dip the entire fucking thing into a tub of mineral oil. And it's basically just like liquid cooling the entire thing. I think it, it causes all kinds of other issues. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, of course, it's the type of shit where like it works for like the, the demo, but then like you after six months, like some random component just like melts. But if you're into liquid cooling and you want to do some custom like training rigs, like there's probably there's probably an opportunity to take a tiny box and dip it in mineral oil and uh, get a bunch of views on YouTube. Uh, interesting to look at the difference of prompting who's been using LLMs for a long time versus someone new to it. I agree with you beyond, but I also think that it's kind of what I was saying where there's no, it's, there's, it's still too early, right? So it's like, I have all these like ways that I prompt, uh, my language models, but it's like, I don't actually know if those are the optimal way of prompting. Right. So when you're going on Twitter and like you scroll and there's some random guy who tells you like, oh, here are the best prompts for X. Did he is that actually true? Like, did he test a bunch of other prompts? Because it seems to me when I've read a bunch of these papers where they mess with the prompts, like it's very non-intuitive. And, and you can have prompts that are very short, but are way better than prompts that are very long. And you can have prompts that are very long that are way better than prompts that are very short. So. I don't think that anybody can say that they're way better at prompt engineering than someone else unless they have the like literal evidence to show it, right? So maybe one of these guys that's very good at stable diffusion, like image generator prompting, you can look at the images that they generate and say like, yeah, okay, these images are definitely better than the ones that I can generate. Therefore, this guy probably has slightly better prompting rules. Therefore, it's okay for me to take his prompts and then use them. But if there's just some random guy on the internet and he's telling you, hey, this is the optimal prompt for coding, 
you don't have to believe that. It's probably not, you know, test it out, but change it because it's definitely not optimal. There's probably some other prompt out there that's better. Agentic frameworks like Devin will change things too. Yeah, that's another important thing too. Once you have these agents, right, where you're, you're no longer interacting directly with the language model, right now, you are directly interacting with the language model, right? You're putting in tokens and those tokens are being put into the actual language model and the actual attention is being computed and then the tokens that are coming out are literally the tokens that are coming out. But I think pretty soon within the next year, there's gonna be a, a layer of separation, right? You're no longer gonna be interacting with the language model directly. You're gonna be interacting with this kind of agent that consumes your prompt and then does a whole bunch of shit. So it might take your prompt, it might add a different prompt, it might remove certain things in your prompt, it might put in different things in your prompt, it'll send that to one language model, that language model will use some rag type situation to look up other information and pull up and put that in the prompt, and then whatever comes out of that language model, you're not gonna see those tokens directly. Those tokens directly will go through some other filtering process where they get removed, maybe other things get added, and then that's what you see. So prompt engineering for that it's going to be a completely different beast than prompt engineering when you're interacting directly with the language model. Okay, question from Magnus. This might be a little bit off topic, but what is your take on C++ programming using CSI, SYCL for writing GPU code to run on Intel, AMD, NVIDIA code instead of being tied to one supplier? Yay or nay? I mean, I'm not like a CUDA programmer. You're, that kind of reminds me of this, Triton, NVIDIA Triton. So I think there's a Triton, Triton, CUDA. What about this? Yeah, I saw this. Triton, open source GPU programming for neural networks. Open source Python-like, which enables researchers with no CUDA experience to write highly efficient GPU code. I don't know. I don't actually know what the fuck I'm talking about. But my high level view on like whether it's worth optimizing GPU code to run on different types of hardware kind of maybe I to me it just feels like it's not the best use of time unless you're particularly interested in that. Right? Cuz it's like I think spending more time on like data set curation and really thinking about your problem and what you want the input and the output to be and like, how am I going to make this data set? Am I going to take a, this particular model and, and then fine tune it on this? Or like, what is the pre-training? I think those questions matter more than like, Hey, if I can implement this one little like CUDA kernel and make this 20% more efficient, then I can train with this slight efficiency increase. It's like, is that efficiency increase? Is that going to be, what makes your overall solution better? Not really, right? The 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 overall solution is going to be a factor of your data sets and like kind of what you're doing. So like that to me seems like the more important part of the problem. To me, the 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 kernels and the kind of like super low level close to the GPU, that's always going to be a mess, right? Because every there's going to be so many GPUs. And there's even more companies now. Xtropic. There's going to be like this huge ex kind of Cambrian explosion when it comes to hardware, and then finding the doing all the hard part of like, hey, here's my PyTorch code, and then here's my hardware. How do I make this PyTorch code optimally perform on this hardware? That is like a kind of like a many-to-many -many mapping problem that there's no optimal solution there, right? It's always gonna be this, this giant mess of tangle of shit. <laughs> and not only is that the case, but each of the hardware providers is heavily incentivized to make it very easy to use their hardware, right? So are you gonna be able to write a better CUDA kernel than the people at NVIDIA who are getting paid to write the best possible CUDA kernels? Probably not. So you're almost better off just kind of waiting for them to just do it for you. But that's just me, right? I'm, I'm kind of sitting at the higher level. I'm not at the low level. There's people who are very interested in this type of stuff like GeoHots, right? Like he has, he lives in that world of like, fucking GPU firmware. So if you're into that, I would definitely recommend his channel. I'm a little bit more high level. I kind of stick to the to the kind of like high level math and then the the deepest I go is like the the framework code. So, I'm sorry, man. I can't give you a good recommendation there. 
check out CUDA mode discord. There you go. I think I've actually heard of that one too. So find your community Magnus. There's, there's a whole bunch of people who are interested in those type of questions, but I, I can't be a good teacher for you for those type of things. Are we good? Is that all the questions? Let's summarize this thing. All right, here's the summary. So today, we did a stream called Instant Splat and Duster. In this stream, we largely reviewed two papers, Instant Splat, and then an associated paper called Duster. Here's the paper, Duster. So Instant Splat is effectively just a Gaussian splatting paper where they get rid of the initialization that is usually done with Colmap. Colmap is a structure from motion pipeline that is the result of decades of computer vision research and is a little bit over-engineered. It's composed of all these different types of modules, which means that you have kind of accumulating error over the course of this pipeline. It's also very complicated very difficult to understand. And kind of the worst part of it is that usually you need dense uh, multi-view images, which means you need a lot of images of one thing that you, you're, you want the 3D reconstruction of, and those images need to cover a lot of different views, and you usually also need ground truth camera poses, which means you need to know where every single camera is, and you also need camera intrinsics, which is basically you need to know all the different properties of that camera, the, the focal length, the principal point, the warping, all of that crap. So that's a huge problem right now in the 3D Gaussian splatting field. So what these guys here at Instant Splat did is they said, okay, well, rather than using Colmap, let's use Duster. And Duster is the newest and latest and radical, and that's their terminology there, a radically novel approach for this multi-view stereo reconstruction problem, which is kind of subsumes nearly all other 3D geometric vision tasks, right? So it's kind of like, if you can do this, you can do everything. And by everything, I mean multi-view depth, 3D reconstruction, monocular depth, multi-view pose estimation, visual localization, right? There's like literally a million different types of problems that are all subsumed within this one problem of MVS or multi-view stereo reconstruction. What Duster does is it basically treats this in a very inductively bias-free way, right? So it doesn't have any geometric constraints. It doesn't use any fancy regularizations or multi-part optimization process. It's basically just trained using a simple, simple regression loss where the regression is simply a Euclidean distance that's weighted by a confidence where the Euclidean distance is between points in a point map, where a point map is basically just a image of some width and height where each pixel or point in that image corresponds to some point in 3D space. And the way that it's doing this is using pre-trained VIT encoders, which are transformers. These pre-trained VIT encoders come from a work known as CROCOP, or not CROCOP, Croco. Croco is a pre-training method to train vision transformers using a masked image modeling loss that uses synthetic pairs of images, so two pairs of images, and then it tries to reconstruct the masked pixels, and it uses this, and then it, this is a really relatively simple pre-training uh, formulation and it's mashing over 2 million pairs of images that are created from these data sets here using the Habitat Simulator, which is a simulator that Meta released for uh, embodied research, but here they're just using it for these uh, synthetic paired images. And that pre-trained vision encoder is used to encode two pairs of images, and then they use a uh, decoders that are cross-attentioning each other in order to produce these point maps. And Duster works quite well. So there is 
a demo that I recommend. You can literally go onto their GitHub, and if you go onto their GitHub, you can run this little grad IO demo, and it works pretty well. You can just feed it random images from a camera that there's no information. You don't need to tell it where the camera is. You don't need to tell it the camera intrinsic. You don't need to tell it anything, and it just gives you a little 3D reconstruction. That's This is not a good example because I literally gave it conflicting information, but here, we can redo it. Let's do. Let's redo it. I'm going to give it these here. Open. There you go. It uploads those. Then I hit run. Boom, 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 boom. Let's see how long it takes. We're at six seconds, seven seconds, eight seconds, nine seconds, 10 seconds. Let's see. I think it's going to take about 20 if I had to guess. There you go. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. And there you go. Look at that. Pretty cool. Little robot. And look at that. Some of these pictures are vertical. Some of these pictures are horizontal. There's weird shadows that it had to deal with. So, Duster is the real deal. It works great. You get state-of-the-art on a bunch of these classic uh, computer vision tasks. And Instant Splat is basically just taking that and using it to initialize Gaussian splatting. And it works quite well as well. So, they compare it to some Nerf-based approaches, and it also seems to be state-of-the-art to some degree. Though, nowadays, you can't really trust state-of-the-art, so... <laughs> Uh, and that's pretty much it, guys. Pretty cool little papers. Hope you got something out of that. Hope you got... I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what you got, but hopefully you're doing good. Can you do some papers which are not LLMs or diffusion models? Maybe some papers related to ML and quantitative finance? <laughs> I'm not super interested in quantitative finance but if you want to come to the discord and, and post a couple papers there maybe i'll i'll go into them but no no promises you know i, I try not to be audience captured i try to just do the papers that are interesting and th these papers are actually coming from uh a recommendation so i asked a guy on uh twitter who yeah, i think he's called the nerf nerf man or something like that but uh i i i I, on the uh, tweet for the stream, I mentioned him. So definitely check him out because he 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 mentions all the Gaussian Splat and Nerf papers. So if you want an exhaustive list of Gaussian Splat and Nerf papers, check him out. But if not, thank you for watching. Thank you, Joseph Enox, Beyond, Ed, Tokyo Spliff, Eigen, Olorin, Emily, Snooks, Magnus, Beyond, Kumar, uh, MWD, Che Cheb Khaled, 87GN, Joshna, Jizong. Uh, who else? I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. WJ Zhao, Khalil, Sam M, Lucas Smith, James McLean. Hope you guys all had a great team and see you guys later. Mm -hmm.